Which of these polynomials are prime? Yes, polynomials can be prime. But this one's not. It's composite, because it can be factored into two smaller polynomials, similarly to how a composite number can be factored into two smaller numbers. So it's composite, but what about the other ones? Well, this is also composite because it has a factorization. And the same with the third. They're all composite. None of these polynomials are prime. However, this factorization requires complex numbers. So that's fine if we view these as complex polynomials. But if we work with them as real polynomials, then we can't make this factorization. Meaning that this is prime in the real polynomials. So by switching the domain we're working in, we've switched the primes. And we can do this further. If we switch to the integer polynomials, then we can no longer make this factorization, since root 6 is not an integer. So that means that this is prime in the integer polynomials. So that leaves us with just the polynomial on top as composite. But we could make it prime too. Can you think of a domain where all of these are prime? I'll give my example later, but first, Let's take a look at the primes from the integer polynomials, the rational polynomials, the real polynomials, and the complex polynomials. And along the way, we'll explore some fun ways to visualize the primes. So let's start with the integer polynomial primes. What are the primes? Well, we have 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. It's just the regular primes that we're familiar with. These are polynomials. We call them constants. And technically we would write them as x to the 0, but we usually just leave that out. Any factorization in the constants just corresponds to a factorization in the integers. And so that means that any constant prime corresponds to an integer prime. So that gives us our first set of primes, the integer primes. Now let's move on to the linear polynomials. This linear polynomial is composite because it has a factorization. And this one is also composite. It has a factorization. Notice that this factorization involves a constant and another linear polynomial. This is the only way to factor a linear polynomial. It must always involve some constant. So this factorization works because that constant, 6, divides both 6 and 24. And this factorization worked because 5 divides 10 and 5. But what about this polynomial? Nothing divides 7 and 8. Their greatest common divisor is 1. So the only way to factor is 1 times itself, meaning that it's prime. And this idea applies in general. Any ax plus b is prime if the greatest common divisor of a and b is 1. A polynomial of this form is called primitive. So our next set of primes is the primitive linears. And now we've got a few different types of primes to work with. Let's visualize them. We'll make a grid with constants on the horizontal axis and the x's on the vertical axis. So here is 3x plus 2, and here is negative x minus 5. Let's graph the primes. They make a pretty cool pattern. Here are those integer primes. They're all on the horizontal axis, since their x coefficient is 0. And then we have x and negative x. These are both prime. And then the rest. And we can make this graph using that greatest common divisor idea, checking each square individually. Or we could get here using a sieve. So we'll start with all of the polynomials, and then remove 0, 1, and negative 1. They're exceptions, neither prime nor composite. Now let's highlight all multiples of 2, the even polynomials. These must be composite, since we can factor out a 2, so let's remove them. And next, we highlight all multiples of 3, and remove them as well. And then continue with the multiples of 5, and so on, until we're just left with the primes. Nice! Let's add back those composites, and color them by their number of prime factors. Darker for more factors. This visualization is fun, but it becomes even more fun when we add the quadratic polynomials. So let's take a look at those. This quadratic is composite. It has a factorization. And notice that we factored out a 2, 
We can do this because the greatest common divisor is 2. So just like with the linears, a quadratic prime must be primitive. It must have a greatest common divisor of 1, otherwise we could factor out the GCD. But being primitive is not enough. This quadratic is primitive, the GCD is 1, but it's composite because we have this factorization. It factors into two linears. So how can we identify this? Well, this factorization tells us that 2 thirds and negative 4 are roots of the polynomial. They set that polynomial to 0. We were able to factor because these roots are rational. If a polynomial has a rational root, p over q, then we can factor out qx minus p, and since we can factor, it's composite. But if the polynomial has only irrational roots, then we can't factor out anything of that form, meaning that it's prime. So if we want to know if this is prime, we should ask, are the roots rational? And to find the roots, we can use the quadratic formula. We want to know if this is rational. Negative b and 2a will be integers, so they will have no effect. We just need to focus on this. Is this rational? And this is a root, so that's the same as asking, is this a square? Let's take this polynomial as an example. If we plug in those coefficients and then reduce, we end up with 196, which is 14 squared. So yes, this is square, meaning yes, the roots are rational, so we can factor it and it's composite. For another example, using this polynomial, we get 184. No, that's not a square, so no, the roots are not rational, meaning that it's prime. So that gives us our next set of primes. We have the primitive irrational quadratics. And here, irrational means the roots, not the coefficients. So now we have more primes to work with. Let's go back to the visualization. We can extend this view to include the quadratic polynomials by adding another dimension. This shows all polynomials with coefficients from negative 12 to positive 12. And the pattern is cool, but we can only see the outside. Let's remove that outer layer. Here are just coefficients up to 11. And this looks a lot different. There are way more primes. It's almost all primes. The only composites are this vertical line, these two diagonal lines, a few around the edge, and some random ones on top. Let's remove a layer again. Here the coefficients just go up to 10. Just like 12, there are a lot of composites. We still have the vertical and diagonal lines, but also a grid over the whole surface. So what's going on? Do you have a guess? We can better understand this if we find the primes using a sieve, just like we did in two dimensions. So let's start with the multiples of 2. They make a 3D grid. Since they're all multiples of 2, they're composite, so let's color them in red. Next, the multiples of 3. They have a similar shape, just more spread out. Let's mark them as composite, too. Then the multiples of 5, the multiples of 7, and so on. At this point, the patterns are pretty nice and regular. Using a maximum of 12, we can see the impression of 2 and 3. Dropping to 11, just a few points are composite. Here is 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Now we should do the linear polynomials. Here are the multiples of x. They form a plane, everything with a zero constant coefficient. And this is that vertical line that we saw earlier. Next, the multiples of x minus 1. It's one of those diagonal lines. And the multiples of x plus 1 is the other diagonal. And this continues. The multiples of x minus 2 are similar, but a little more spread out. And as we continue, we see the same applies for the other planes, until the sieve is done. So that sieve explains the grid and the lines, but what about the random spots on the top and bottom? Why aren't there any on the sides? The top and bottom corresponds to the x coefficient, which is more flexible than the other coefficients from the sides. If the polynomial has a factorization, then we can multiply this out, and we see the a and c must also have a factorization. So if a is 11, then it must factor as 1 times 11. There's only this one option. And the same goes for c. 
But b is the sum of two products. So if b is 11, there are a lot of ways we can get there. We could do negative 2 times 3 minus 5 times 1, or negative 5 times 3 plus 2 times 2. And that's why we see more composites on the top and bottom than on the sides. And it's not just 11. This happens when the max is another prime, like 13 or 7. Cool. And this kind of wraps up our study of the integer polynomials. We could continue with the cubics, but it's a little tricky. A cubic can be factored as a constant times a cubic, or as a linear times a quadratic. We can rule out a constant factor if the polynomial is primitive, just like we've seen before. And we can rule out a linear factor if it only has irrational roots, also how we've seen before. And that's actually enough to guarantee a prime. It's just like the quadratics. So we have primitive irrational quadratics and cubics. That wasn't so hard, so what's the problem? Well, to test the roots in quadratics, we use the quadratic formula. So now we would need the cubic formula. This is the problem. It's fine in theory, but no one wants to use this in practice. And things only get harder from here. If we move on to the quartic polynomials, the ones with a power of 4, we can have this factorization, which is both hard to read and really hard to identify. So it's a good place to stop. And we need a place to stop because there are arbitrarily large primes. This is prime, all the powers of x up to 4. And so is this, all the powers up to 6. And the same with all the powers up to 100. This works in general, as long as the highest power is some integer prime p minus 1. And because the integer primes get arbitrarily large, so do the integer polynomial primes. So we'll never fully describe them. The rules will just continue to grow. There are some other prime tests that we can use, like checking the factors of the coefficients, or the Eisenstein criterion, or using modular arithmetic. And I'll talk more about this last one in my next video, which will be all about applying modular arithmetic to prime polynomials. But for now, let's move on to the rational polynomial primes. These are mostly the same as the integer polynomial primes. And that's because any rational factorization is based on an integer factorization. This integer polynomial has a rational factorization. But if we adjust this a bit, if we multiply 4 thirds on the left and 3 quarters on the right, we just get an integer factorization. The rationals don't give us any new ways to factor. So if we have some integer prime that doesn't have a factorization, it will also be a rational prime, because it won't have any new factorization. So there's our first set of primes. It's just the same ones from the integers. But it only works when they're non-constant. This doesn't work with a constant prime like 2. In the integers, 2 is a prime. If we multiply a polynomial by 2, it becomes even. It has some evenness. But in the rationals, there is no evenness, because we can just go backwards by multiplying by a half. 2 isn't prime anymore. It's now a unit, a number with an inverse. I talked a lot about units in my video on the complex primes, so I'll just give a brief overview here. Primes are useful because they give us unique factorization. There is only one way to factor 30 using primes. It's not truly unique, we could also factor in these ways, but they're just rearrangements of the same prime. This factorization is unique up to order. But we should notice that if we include the negative integers, we could also have a factorization like this. It's the same factorization, just slightly different. 2 has been multiplied by negative 1, which is a unit, and then we also have this extra negative 1, also a unit. So unique factorization works up to order, and units. And this has some interesting consequences. This polynomial is an integer composite because it has a factorization in two primes. This is a non-constant prime, meaning that it's also a rational prime. But the 5 is a rational unit. And since units don't affect the factorization, that means that this factorization only has one prime. So the left side must therefore be prime. And there's nothing special about 5. This would happen with any non-zero constant. If we scale a prime, we'll still be left with a prime. So it's not just the non-constant integer primes. It's any scalar multiples of non-constant integer primes.
But that's it. Those are all the primes. So now we've looked at the integer primes and the rational primes, it's time to move on to the complex primes. These are actually the easiest. And they're the easiest because of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Every complex polynomial can be factored into linear complex polynomials. So for example, this polynomial can be factored into linear polynomials, meaning that it's composite, it has a factorization. And this idea applies in general. Any polynomial will have some linear factorization, meaning that it's composite. The only exception is if it's already linear, because then the linear factorization is not really a factorization, so it's prime. And that's all the primes, it's just the linears. Okay, so the complex primes are just the linears. And now it's time to get a better understanding of the real polynomial primes. And to do this, we'll use the fundamental theorem of algebra. So if we apply this to some real polynomial, p of x, we get a linear factorization. Some of those factors can be real, but some of them might be complex. And we need a way around that, because we're looking for a real factorization. But luckily, these complex linears come in pairs. And if we multiply the pair together, we get a real quadratic. But why? Let's say we have a complex linear, x minus c, that divides p of x. What if we flip the complex plane upside down? If c starts here, it will end up here, the flipped position. We call this c bar. But notice, the real line doesn't move. All the real numbers stay the same. So x minus c goes to x minus c bar, but because p is a real polynomial, it just stays the same. And this means that x minus c bar divides p of x. Both of these complex linears divide p of x, which means their product divides p of x. And their product is a real quadratic we can get rid of the complex linears by pairing them up. So every real polynomial has a factorization into linears and quadratics with complex roots. So these are the primes. If a polynomial is not one of these types, it must have a factorization into them. So let's mark them down as primes. And it's pretty easy to recognize a linear, but how do we tell if a quadratic has complex roots? Well, we find the roots with the quadratic formula. We want to know, is this complex? And we really just need to focus here, because we get a complex number by taking the square root of a negative. So we just need to ask, is this negative? All right, so let's label those types of primes here, and there we are. We've looked at the primes in all of these domains. So that just leaves us with one remaining question. What domain makes all of these prime? You may have come up with a different answer, but my example is the polynomials with even powers. And we write this with an x squared in the brackets. But the z means these are integer polynomials. We could also take these to be rational, or real, or complex. The coefficients don't matter, because each of these factorizations involves an odd power of x, so none of them will be allowed, and therefore these are all prime. Thanks for watching! If you liked this visualization, you can play around with it yourself. I've linked the code in the description. So check it out, have some fun, and I'll see you in the next video.